Amen, amen. It's great to see everybody here today. I invite you to grab those teaching notes that you received as you came in as we continue our series, Elephant in the Room, talking about some of those topics that sometimes we don't talk about, but we need to talk about. And so that's what we're doing from Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Uh, we've been talking the last few weeks about how God is a God of love, and he has wonderful plans for us as his sons and daughters, but we know that he also has a capacity to hate. He hates anything that would hurt us, that would damage our life, that would damage the plans that he has for us, just like a earthly father would hate anything that would hurt or damage his kids. God hates that which really robs uh, of the potential he has for us. And so we've been diving into some of those topics to see if really God can help us just really live the life that God wants us to live so we can experience his best for us. Talked a couple of weeks ago about haughty eyes and, and what is haughtiness. It's really approaching people from a perspective of I'm better than you. That, that's what haughtiness refers, refers to. It's approaching people and seeing people and living life kind of above others thinking, why well, I'm better than you. And God does not want us to live that way, does he? He wants us to, to really live in humility really valuing others and seeing them as better than us. And then last, last Sunday, Mitch and Trent did just a great job, hit a home run talking about a lying tongue and how really truth will lead us to experience God's best in our life. Truth will always lead us to experience his best for us. And, and now today, what we're talking about hands that shed innocent blood as we just continue walking through Proverbs 6, there's 16 through 19. And really, uh, this, this command is the command to not murder that we find in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments. God had, had freed the Israelites from captivity, and he then gave them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and they were really away for the Israelites to express through their life gratitude to God and show separation from society. And really, we find that they are uh, beneficial for us today in that same capacity. But by living a life that's honoring to God, it shows gratitude for who he is and for what he's done in our life. And it also gives us the chance to show separation from society and therefore direct people and bring glory to God. And what are a few different ways that they are beneficial for us and the culture that we live in today? Well, there are many, but let me just, you know, let's throw out a couple here that I read that you might want to write down in your note sheet. Number one is this. Uh, they're not fill-ins, but you can write them, write them down somewhere. Uh, they teach us about healthy relationships. The Ten Commandments help us in our relationships in life. The first four commands specifically deal with our vertical relationship with God and then the remaining commands really teach us about how to have healthy relationships with one another. Right worship should also include right social relationships and the Ten Commandments help us to do that, all right? How about this, number two, uh, they, they teach us to slow down. Hey, have you realized that life can get a bit busy and chaotic? And it's possible to kind of miss out and kind of go just too fast, have too much going on, and all of a sudden we're not creating time for our relationship with God and for relationships with our family and other meaningful relationships in our life. And the, t the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, really stress the importance of slowing down. How about this? Number three, they help us to use social media well. There's like the whole Instagram effect, right? Where, where you go on social media and you just lurk there and you like begin to like see the life that these people on social media are projecting is their reality. And then we begin to compare ourselves to them and it impacts our self-esteem. It impacts how we feel about ourselves. Then we feel bummed out. And, and the Ten Commandments, it says, man, don't covet, don't compare. You know, be content with where God has you. And then number four and two, really the point for today, 
they really teach us to value human life. Value human life. Uh, what, a year ago, I think it was, I was uh, with some of our staff and some of our board, and we were going to learn and kind of just check out this uh, a multi-site church in Renton. And a multi-site church is, is a church that has multiple campuses, but one church in an effort to really reach a community or region for Jesus. And so we were there kind of checking out that church. And the night before, we were at uh, Cheesecake Factory, which is right by the South Center Mall. And we're hanging out, and all of a sudden, police officers begin to converge everywhere. So you're looking out, and you're seeing, like, cops and, and, and rifles, and there's, there's a bunch of them everywhere. And you're thinking, what's, what's going on here? Well, we would find out the waitress told us that there was concern or talk about it. There was someone who fired a, a, a gun off in the South Center Mall. And the reality is this, that that's happening more and more, isn't it? It's not near as shocking as it used to be to see, tragically, someone shoot in a mall or, or in a school. Whereas as, as followers of Jesus, we are really called to value human life, to hold up the value of life. So, so let me tell you, and this is on your note sheet, why is murder wrong? Because every person is a creation of God. Every person is a creation of God. Can I remind you today that you are a unique creation of God? The Bible says in Ephesians, for we are God's handiwork. Other translations say workmanship or masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You are valuable not because of how much you can bench press, not because they ask you out on a second date, not because you get the job, not because you get the promotion, not because you get straight A's, not because of the number on the scale when you get on it. You are valuable because you are a unique creation of God, created on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. What does the Bible say in, in Psalm? It says that, that, that he just knit us together and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Bible says in Romans, who are you, O human being, to talk back to God? Show what is formed, say to who formed it, why did you make me like this? I, I think a lot will change for us in a good way when we begin to really view every person we come in contact with through the lens of them being a creation of God. They are a unique creation of God. God, imagine how that would change just marriage, family, work, career, friendships as we view people as a creation of God. So now the rest of our time, we're going to look at some different ways that, that we tend to shed innocent blood. Some is very obvious, some is not so obvious, but there's a, a few different ways for us to think about here today. And number one is this, we, we shed innocent blood at times with our hands. Now what is that speak of, well, that speaks of, of someone by force ending the life of another person. In, in a sense, they are attempting to play God, saying, well, I'm going to determine the number of your days. I'm going to determine when your life is going to end. And so you have that through crime and, and through murder, but then there are some other ways that innocent blood is shed as well, and they are very sensitive topics, but they are real. Uh, one, I think, would be through abortion. The Bible says that, that God created us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And God has a unique plan and purpose for each life, even before they're born. God is a God of life. And so anytime that we are taking life, we are really acting outside the character and the nature of God. Now, now, now here's what I know. Here's what I know, that, that throughout, you know, the services today and people watching 
online, there will be many people. And, and, and you have had an abortion. There will be many people and, and, and maybe you have encouraged an abortion. Maybe it's been weeks or, or months or years and, and you just feel the, the guilt of that. And can I just really speak into your life today that we serve a God of forgiveness. Man, we serve a God of, of mercy. Man, and we can come to the Lord and seek forgiveness and the Bible says that, that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And that you don't have to live in guilt and condemnation for the rest of your days. In fact, the enemy would want you to do that. Because then it impacts how God can use you the rest of your life. So man, I just encourage you, if maybe you, you've been down that road, man, receive forgiveness. In fact, we, we find people in the Bible who have, who have hurt others and injured others and had horrific past, but God redeemed them and they were forgiven and then they were used powerfully and mightily for God. You don't need to be held back by your past. You can move forward to the wonderful and glorious future God has for you. Another area that's sensitive but it's very real today is this the whole topic of, of suicide. I'm sure you've seen, you know, how it's very prevalent today. Could be from, there's, there's many well-known people, if you will, who have taken a life from, from, what, Robin Williams and Kate Spade, the fashion designer, Anthony Bourdain, the, the TV food show host. And, and it tragically, tragically, Suicide is, is on the rise. In, in nearly every state, in some states, as much as 30%. 30%. Think about that. And I've been a pastor for around 20 years and, and done just a whole bunch of funerals. And, and the funeral of a suicide is, is among the most difficult that there is. But I, I'm also aware that Throughout the services today, there are people just really going through difficult seasons and probably feel incredible despair. And if I could just share a couple things with you today, I would say, number one is this. Your life has value. Your life has value. I, mean, I was praying for you this morning that you met just, just, that just, man, the, the reality of what people are facing, your life has value. You know, the, the, the command to, to not murder in Exodus 20, it, it has no direct object. It, it doesn't say not to murder your fellow man or not to murder another person. It says don't murder, which includes self-murder. See, you have a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. You're not just some random like clump of dust thrown together. No, like we've just looked at in the scripture, God uniquely and specifically created you with a wonderful and beautiful purpose and, and hope is found and hope begins when we, we begin to realize that God has an agenda for my life and I'm not gonna give the enemy a victory over me or my family. By walking down that road, no, I'm going to tap into God's future for me. You have value. Never forget that you have value. I think number two will just remind us all that there is nothing that we are going through or will go through that is too big for God. There is nothing that you're going through right now or that you will go through that is too big for God. You know, e even in the Bible we find individuals who were facing incredible difficulty. Man, e e Elijah, 
in 1 Kings 19, I think it is, and Paul even in 2 Corinthians 1.8, I think it is, where, where him speaking of his past, he says, we were under so much pressure that we despaired for life. But what, what, what did they do? They, they did not succumb to the feelings of the moment, but trusted in God, went to the Lord to find hope and to find purpose and to find meaning. He is our reason for living. I think it's so important as well, just kind of, just third, just to, to be sure we're just talking about it. Man, I would encourage you, if, you've got, if you get like this, this passing thought in your mind, man, just, just move it right out. Just, just move those thoughts right up. The Bible says to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Don't, don't dwell on it or stew on it. But if you find yourself just kind of just going there, struggling with that line of thinking to engage with someone and talk about it, I do think it's important that, that we as parents are talking to our kids about it. They're under so much pressure in this culture today and there's bullying going on at school that we need to be talking to our kids and asking our kids questions, asking our grandkids questions. Friends need to be asking friends questions and having conversation. In fact, someone just this last week was was talking about how in just moments and seasons like that, just, as they got over just the, 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 the stigma of it, it was the, the step to engage in dialogue, to talk to someone, to not walk that in isolation that made all the difference in their life. Man, here's what we've got to realize. The Bible says that, that the enemy comes, the thief. He wants to steal and kill and destroy, doesn't he? But that God has come that we may have life and have it to the full. Man, God is a God of life. He has a purpose for you. But we wanted, our, our host is gonna come down right now and hand out this, just a helpful resource card. And we wanted to just put something in your hands that maybe you're just at kind of a real difficult point. First and foremost, go to God. But, but also, we've got some just helpful resources to put in your hands. Just phone numbers and text lines and, and wonderful re online Christian resources from Focus on the Family. Broadcasts that you can listen to and articles that you can check out. And I encourage you to take advantage <clears throat> of that. So, we shed innocent blood with our hands. Number two is this, we do it with our hearts. Now, here's why this is so important. It's very possible that you walk in today and you think, okay, I'm going to worship. Okay, the message is on not murdering. I don't plan to do that. So I'm just going to kind of watch the World Cup scores on my phone and see what's going on. But, but look what the Bible says about this. Check up on screen here. The Bible says in 1 John, it says anyone who does what? Hates a brother or sister is a what? murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Okay, now we're starting to get real up in here. Okay, all right? Look at next, next passage, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And we would all agree with that, say that's good, that's right. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to what? Will be subject to judgment. See, Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, and, and I'm so excited about this fall. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount. We're doing a spiritual journey called Paradox. It's going to be a great time. We're planning it right now. We're going to be doing a lot of cool stuff just to love on our community. It's going to be awesome. Okay, it's going to be awesome. But Jesus is is in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's, he's teaching. He said, listen, you, you've heard that was said this, that, that if you murder, there's judgment. And we're like, okay, that makes sense. But then as Jesus often does, he raises the bar. He said, here's it, you, you've heard this, but let me tell you what the reality is. If you're angry 
with a brother or sister, you'll be subject to judgment. Now, there's different types of anger, isn't there? There's, there's a holy anger against sin and, and injustice that is good. What, what the anger Jesus ad- is addressing here is a unholy anger against another person. In fact, if you want to write this in your note sheet somewhere, the, the word anger, it literally speaks of like this, this inward malice you could write down or a settled anger in the heart. An inward malice or a settled anger in the heart. Jesus is saying, man, I tell you that, that if you're living that way in, in bitterness and resentment against another person, there's going to be judgment for that. Jesus raises the bar, says, I want to deal with the inward heart matter. And this is so important because we find examples in the Bible where, where an inward anger led to an outward action of hurting another person. It, it, it begins in the heart, doesn't it? It begins on the inside. Think of Cain and Abel in the Bible in Genesis. Okay, they, they were heirs to the entire world. They had huge possessions, but they still had jobs. Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. And if you were to read in Genesis, offering time came. It was time for what they called first fruits. It's not really a term that we use today, but basically out of the first and best round of their crops or livestock, they brought that to God. And that took faith because they didn't have pesticides or irrigation rights like we have today. So they brought that, and, and the Bible says that Cain brought some of the fruits, and Abel brought just the first fruits. And so God looked with favor on Abel's sacrifice, but not on Cain's sacrifice. And this led to an inward jealousy on Cain's part, and it led to an outward action of murder. And Abel became the first martyr. So all of a sudden we begin to ask ourselves, is there bitterness and resentment that I am holding against another person. Man, maybe it won't be that we murder or physically harm them, but we just wish them ill will. And is there just resentment and bitterness going on in, in our heart? It's a way that we can shed innocent blood, the Bible talks about, and then number three is with our speech. With our speech, look what the Bible says up here. I think it's in Matthew where it says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good sort up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil sort up in him. Now check this next verse out right here because this is super, 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 super scary. But I tell you that everyone will give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. I think another translation says careless word they have spoken. Now that's scary, isn't it? Every careless word we've spoken will give an account for. All of a sudden we, we find that, that our words matter. Our words, if we're a person of gossip or slander, just cutting other people down, belittling others. And as that kind of is, is flowing out of us, it's revealing what's going on in our heart. That what flows out of our mouth is just very clearly an indication of the condition of our heart. So all of a sudden, if a person is, is speaking life in their home, speaking life in their marriage to their kids, to their friends, to other people, and, and at work, just as life giver, it reveals something on the inside. But if we're just hurting others, it reveals more about us than them. That's why the Bible says to, to only let those things that would build others up come out of your mouth. Hey, here, let me just... Let's, let's break this entire message down to one scripture. 
Here in Proverbs, check it out. Last, last scripture for the day. It says, above all else, guard your what? Heart. For everything you do flows from it. Man, can we just read that again? Above all else, of utmost importance, of first priority, everything in your it comes above all else. Guard your heart. Guard the condition of your heart. Because everything will come from that. And so how's the condition of your heart this morning? Man, is it full of just life and vitality? Is there resentment, bitterness, anger that you need to take care of? Man, let, let's, let's deal with the condition of our heart here this morning so we can leave here with hope and life and people that God wants us to be. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me here just for a moment? Just want to ask at this moment, would you just kind of just ask the Lord that question? Ask yourself that question. How's my heart? How's my heart? Maybe you're here today and, and your heart's been full of guilt, condemnation for past mistakes. And the enemy's just really just pounded that on you. You don't have a future. You can't be used of God. Think about what you've done. And if I could just speak into your life right now, there is forgiveness and there is grace and there is mercy. And you can leave this place full of life and anticipation for how God wants to, to use you. Man, would you just receive forgiveness and mercy in the moment and commit to leaving here with no condemnation. Maybe there is resentment, bitterness towards another person. It could be a past relationship. It could be a parent. It could be a friend. It could be a sibling. But there's just resentment. And when you lay your head on your pillow at night or when you're just driving in the car on a long drive and you think of this person, you wish them ill will. And it's just, and you don't like it. It's just, and, and just, there needs to be a laying down of resentment. Saying, don't, Bob says, don't take revenge. Let me do that, God says. You just love and live. Would you even right now say, I forgive that person. And I forgive that person. I'm not going to let them have control over my life anymore. I'm going to forgive. I want to guard my heart. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of life. We thank you that as we look at the Bible, we can celebrate who you are and what you've done and how you've created every person here. Lord, I pray that every person here would leave today thinking, man, I'm, I'm a creation of God. I'm uniquely created by God. I look the way he want me, wants me to look. I act the way he wants me to act. I'm just the personality he wants me to have to accomplish the unique agenda he has for my life. And Lord, I pray that there would just be a hop in our step as we leave this place knowing that full well. Lord, I pray for those who are just in a season of despair. I pray, God, that the truth of your scripture, the truth of our life in you would just really overwhelm them and flood their hearts even right now. That they would not give the enemy a foothold in their life, but they would remind themselves of the plans and purposes you have for them. Lord, we thank you for you giving your life for us. Lord, I pray for that person that maybe has, has never given their heart to Jesus. And they find themselves going right now, God, I can't do this on my own. Today I want to invite you into my heart to transform my heart, transform my life, and, and commit my life to you. That even in this moment they would invite you in. So they could spend eternity with you forever. Say, Jesus, forgive me my sins today. I commit my life to you, the giver of life. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, 
Amen, amen. Hey, if you committed your heart to Jesus this morning or recommitted your life to Jesus, we just celebrate that with you. Please, please, please drop by the Connect Center on the way out. We've got some information we'd love to give you. Let's stand to our feet. Shall we? Thanks so much for hanging out today. Have a great, great day. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place.